Accident by F. S. Flint. Read for LibriVox.org by Asha. Dear one, you sit there in the corner of the carriage, and you do not know me, and your eyes forbid. Is it the dirt, the squalor, the wear of human bodies, and the dead faces of our neighbors? These are but symbols. You are proud. I praise you. Your mouth is set. You see beyond us, and you see nothing. I have the vision of your calm, cold face, and of the black hair that waves above it. I watch you. I love you. I desire you. There is a quiet here, within the thud-thud of the wheels upon the railway. There is a quiet here, within my heart, but tense and tender. This is my station. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Apology by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Ivers Think me not unkind and rude That I walk alone in grove and glen I go to the god of the wood To fetch his word to men Tax not my sloth that I Fold my arms beside the brook each cloud that floated in the sky writes a letter in my book. Chide me not, laborious band, for the idle flowers I brought. Every aster in my hand goes home loaded with a thought. There was never mystery, but tis figured in the flowers. Was never secret history, but birds tell it in the bowers. One harvest from thy field Homeward brought the oxen strong. A second crop thine acres yield, Which I gather in a song. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Barefoot Boy by John Greenleaf Whittier. Read for LibriVox.org by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in July 2020. Blessings on thee, little man, barefoot boy with cheek of tan, with thy turned up pantaloons and thy merry whistled tunes, with thy red lip, redder still, kissed by strawberries on the hill. With the sunshine on thy face, through thy torn brim's jaunty grace. From my heart I give thee joy, I was once a barefoot boy. Prince thou art, the grown-up man only is republican, let the million-dollared ride. Barefoot, trudging at his side, thou hast more than he can buy in the reach of ear and eye. Outward sunshine, inward joy, blessings on thee, barefoot boy. Oh, for boyhood's painless play, sleep that wakes in laughing day, health that mocks the doctor's rules, knowledge never learned of schools, of the wild bee's morning chase, of the wild flower's time and place, flight of fowl and habitude, of the tenants of the wood, how the tortoise bears his shell, how the woodchuck digs his cell, and the ground mole sinks his well. How the robin feeds her young, how the oriole nest is hung, where the whitest lilies blow, where the freshest berries grow, where the ground nut trails its vine, where the wood grapes clusters shine. Oh, the black wasp's cunning way, mason of his walls of clay, and the architectural plans of grey hornet artisans. For eschewing books and tasks, nature answers all he asks. Hand in hand with her he walks, face to face with her he talks. Part and parcel of her joy, blessings on the barefoot boy. 
oh for boyhood's time of june crowding years in one brief moon when all things i heard or saw me their master waited for i was rich in flowers and trees hummingbirds and honey-bees for my sport the squirrel played plied the snouted mole his spade for my taste the blackberry cone purpled over hedge and stone laughed the brook for my delight through the day and through the night whispering at the garden wall talked with me from fall to fall mine the sand-rimmed pickerel pond mine the walnut slopes beyond mine on bended orchard trees apples of hesperides still as my horizon grew larger grew my riches too all the world i saw or knew seemed a complex chinese toy fashioned for a barefoot boy oh for festal dainty spread like my bowl of milk and bread pewter spoon and bowl of wood on the doorstone gray and rude o'er me like a regal tent cloudy ribbed the sunset bent purple curtained fringed with gold looped in many a wind-swung fold while for music came the play of the pied frog's orchestra and to light the noisy choir lit the fly his lamp of fire i was monarch pomp and joy waited on the barefoot boy cheerily then my little man live and laugh as boyhood can though the flinty slopes be hard stubble speared and new-mown sward every morn shall lead thee through fresh baptisms of the dew every evening from thy feet shall the cool wind kiss the heat all too soon these feet must hide in the prison cells of pride lose the freedom of the sod like a colt's for work be shod made to tread the mills of toil up and down in ceaseless moil happy if their track be found never on forbidden ground happy if they sink not in quick and treacherous sands of sin ah that thou couldst know thy joy ere it passes barefoot boy end of the poem this librivox recording is in the public domain Be a Friend by Edgar Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Corey Jaffone Be a friend, you don't need money, just a disposition sunny, just the wish to help another get along some way or other, just a kindly hand extended out to one who's unbefriended, just the will to give or lend, this will make you someone's friend. Be a friend, you don't need glory. Friendship is a simple story. Pass by trifling errors blindly. Gaze on honest effort kindly. Cheer the youth who's bravely trying. Pity him who's sadly sighing. Just a little labor spend on the duties of a friend. Be a friend, the pay is bigger, though not written by a figure than is earned by people clever in what's merely self-endeavor. You'll have friends instead of neighbors for the profits of your labors. You'll be richer in the end than a prince if you're a friend. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Behold the Water of Waters, from the Mesnavi of Jalaladina Rumi, translated by E. H. Winfield, read for LibriVox.org by Daniel Davison. Behold the Water of Waters. The sea itself is one thing, the foam another. Neglect the foam, and regard the sea with your eyes. Waves of foam rise from the sea night and day. You look at the foam ripples, and not at the mighty sea. We, like boats, are tossed hither and thither. We are blind, though we are on the bright ocean. 
Ah, you who are asleep in the boat of the body, you see the water. Behold, the water of waters. Under the water you see there is another water moving it. Within the spirit is a spirit that calls it. When you have accepted the light, O beloved, when you behold what is veiled without a veil, like a star you will walk upon the heavens. End of Behold the Water of Waters This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the Beloved from Afar by Nicholas Linau Translated by Charles Wharton Stork Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist His sweet rose here over sea I must gather sadly, Which, beloved, unto thee I would bring how gladly, But, alas, if o'er the foam I this flower should carry, It would fade ere I could come, Roses may not tarry. Father, let no mortal fare Who would be a wooer, then unwithered he may bear blushing roses to her or the nightingale may fly for her nesting grasses or then with the west wind's sigh her soft warbling passes end of poem this recording is in the public domain blue by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, read for LibriVox.org by Mike Overby, Midland, Washington. Standing at the window, feeling kind of glum, listening to the raindrops play the kettle drum, looking across the meadows, swimming like a sea. Lord, have mercy on us! What's the good of me? Can't go a hoeing, wouldn't if I could. Ground too wet for hunting. Fishing ain't no good, too much noise for sleeping, no one hear the chat. Des must stand and listen to the pitter pat. Hills is getting misty, valleys getting dark. Watchdogs mince a howlin', rather have them bark. Dan a moanin' solemn, somewhere out of sight. Rain crow des a chucklin', dis is his delight. Mandy, bring my banjo, bring the chillin' in. Come in from the kitchen, I feel sick as sin. Call in Uncle Isaac, call Aunt Harriet, too. Tain't no use in talkin', child, I surely blew. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Kennedy Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, All in the valley of death rode the six hundred. Forward, the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Forward, the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldiers knew, someone had blundered. Theirs was not to make reply, theirs was not to reason why, theirs was but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death. Into the mouth of hell rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabers bare, flashed as they turned in ear, sabering the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wandered. Plunging in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the six hundred. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, 
stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell, they that fought so well, came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made, all the world wandered. Honor the charge they made, honor the light brigade, noble six hundred. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Common Joys by Edgar Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Corey Jaffone. These joys are free to all who live, the rich and poor, the great and low. The charms which kindness has to give, the smiles which friendship may bestow, the honor of a well-spent life, the glory of a purpose true, high courage in the stress of strife, and peace when every task is through. Nor class, nor caste, nor race, nor creed, nor greater might can take away the splendor of an honest deed, who nobly serves from day to day, shall walk the road of life with pride, with friends who recognize his worth. For never are these joys denied unto the humblest man on earth. Not all may rise to worldwide fame, not all may gather fortune's gold, not all life's luxuries may claim, in differing ways success is told. But all may know the peace of mind which comes from service brave and true. The poorest man can still be kind and nobly live till life is through. These joys abound for one and all. The pride of fearing no man's scorn, of standing firm where others fall, of bearing well what must be borne. He that shall do an honest deed shall win an honest deed's rewards. For these, no matter race or creed, life unto every man affords. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The County Fair by Edwin C. Rank Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Oh, let's go out to the county fair And breathe the balmy country air And whittle a stick and look at the hosses Discuss the farmer's profit and losses We'll take a look at the country stock And drink some milk from a dairy crock Look at the pigs and admire the chickens And try to forget it's hot as the dickens Forget there are any political rings. Just think of the butter and eggs and things. So wash off the buggy and hitch up the mare, and we'll all go out to the county fair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Cushag's Friend by Josephine Kermode Writing as Cushag, read for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon. Oh, the Cushag flower in a fairy bower would shine like a star of gold, but when it grows in the farmer's close, tis a shocking weed, we're told. Yet common things may have their wings to help our souls above, and wayside weeds like kindly deeds spring from a father's love. The Cushag flower had fairy power in olden times, you know to bear you away on a summer's day wherever you wished to go. Its golden wings were slender things to carry souls aloft, but fairy tales like freshening gales may have their uses oft. The cushag flower in a stormy hour shines brighter for the gloom, so kindly deeds like wayside weeds may shine when troubles loom. Old folks would say in their own day when troubles took their fill and times were bad and hearts were sad, there's ghoul on the Kishag still. Now, the Kushag we know must never grow where the farmer's work is done. 
but along the rills in the heart of the hills the cushag may shine like the sun where the golden flowers have fairy powers to gladden our hearts with their grace and in van and vegveen in the valleys green the cushags still have a place end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Death of the Old Year by Alfred Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Simone Tony. Full knee-deep lies the winter snow, And the winter winds are wearily sighing. Toll ye the church bell sad and slow, And tread softly and speak low, For the old year lies a-dying. Old year, you must not die, You came to us so readily, You lived with us so steadily, Old year, you shall not die. He lieth still, he doth not move, he will not see the dawn of day, he hath no other life above, he gave me a friend and a true, true love, and the new year will take him away. Old year, you must not go, so long as you have been with us, such joy as you have seen with us, old year, you shall not go. He frothed his bumpers to the brim, a jollier year we shall not see, but though his eyes are waxing dim, and though his foes speak ill of him, he was a friend to me. Old year, you shall not die. We did so laugh and cry with you. I've half a mind to die with you. Old year, if you must die. He was full of joke and jest, but all his merry quips are o'er. To see him die across the waste, his son and heir doth ride post haste, but he'll be dead before. Every one for his own. The night is starry and cold, my friend, and the new year blithe and bold, my friend, comes up to take his own. How hard he breathes! Over the snow I heard just now the crowing cock. The shadows flicker to and fro, the cricket chirps, the light burns low. Tis nearly twelve o'clock. Shake hands before you die. Old year will dearly rue for you. What is it we can do for you? Speak out before you die. His face is growing sharp and thin. Alack! Our friend is gone. Close up his eyes, tie up his chin. Step from the corpse and let him in, that standeth there alone and waiteth at the door. There's a new foot on the floor, my friend, and a new face at the door, my friend, a new face at the door. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Dreamer by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. Temples he built, and palaces of air, and with the artist's parent pride aglow, his fancy saw his vague ideals grow into creations marvelously fair. He set his foot upon fame's nether stair. But ah, his dream! It had entranced him so he could not move, he could no farther go, but paused in joy that he was even there. He did not wake until one day there gleamed through his dark consciousness a light that racked his being until he rose alert to act. But lo, what he had dreamed, the while he dreamed, another wedding action into thought, into the living, pulsing world had brought. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Embarrassing Episode of Little Miss Muffet by Guy Whitmore Carroll, read for LibriVox.org by Bookworm360. Little Miss Muffet discovered a tuffet, which never occurred to the rest of us, and as t'was a June day and just about noonday, she wanted to eat like the best of us. Her diet was whey, and I hasten to say it is wholesome, and people grow fat on it. The spot being lonely, the lady not only discovered the tuffet, but sat upon it. A rivulet gabbled beside her and babbled as rivulets often are thought to do, and dragonflies sported around and cavorted, as poets say dragonflies ought to do. When glancing aside for a moment she spied a horrible sight that brought fear to her, a hideous spider was sitting beside her, and most unavoidably near to her. Albeit unsightly, this creature politely said, Madam, I earnestly vow to you, I am penitent that I did not bring my hat, I should otherwise certainly bow to you. Though anxious to please, he was so ill at ease that he lost all his sense of propriety, and he grew so inept that he clumsily steps in her plate, which is barred in society.
This curious error completed her terror. She shuddered and, growing much paler, not only left Tuffet, but dealt him a buffet, which doubled him up in a sailor knot. It must be explained that at this he was pained. He cried, I have vexed you, no doubt of it. Your fist's like a truncheon. You're still in my luncheon, was all that she answered. Get out of it. And the moral is this, be it madam or miss, to whom you have something to say. You're only absurd if you get in the curd, but you're rude if you get in the way. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Erasmus Darwin on his work entitled Zoonomia by Dewhurst Billsborough. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Hail to the bard who sung from chaos hurled how suns and planets formed the whirling world, how sphere on sphere earth's hidden strata bend and caves of rock her central fires defend where gems new-born their twinkling eyes unfold and young oars shoot in arborescent gold how the fair flower by zephyr wooed unfurls its panting leaves and waves its azure curls or spreads in gay undress its lucid form to meet the sun and shuts it to the storm while in green veins impassioned eddies move and beauty kindles into life and love how the first embryon fire, sphere, or cube lives in new forms, a line, a ring, a tube. Closed in the womb with limbs unfinished laves, sips with rude mouth the salutary waves, seeks round its cell the sanguine streams that pass, and drinks with crimson gills the vital gas, weaves with soft threads the blue meandering vein, the heart's red concave and the silver brain leads the long nerve expands the impatient sense and clothes in silken skin the nascent ends erewhile emerging from its liquid bed it lifts in gelid air its nodding head the light's first dawn with trembling eyelid hells with lungs untaught arrests the balmy gales tries its new tongue in tones unknown and hears the strange vibrations with unpractised ears seeks with spread hands the bosom's velvet orbs with closing lips the milky fount absorbs and as compressed the dulcet streams distill drinks warmth and fragrance from the living rill eyes with mute rapture every waving line prints with adoring kiss the paphian shrine and learns ere long the perfect form confessed ideal beauty from its mother's breast now in strong lines with bolder tints designed you sketch ideas and portray the mind teach how fine atoms of impinging light to ceaseless change the visual sense excite while the bright lens collects the rays that swerve and bends their focus on the moving nerve how thoughts to thoughts are linked with viewless chains tribes leading tribes and trains pursuing trains with shadowy trident how volition guides surge after surge his intellectual tides or queen of sleep imagination rose with frantic sorrows or delirious loves go on o friend explore with eagle eye where wrapped in night retiring causes lie trace their slight bands their secret haunts betray and give new wonders to the beam of day till link by link with step aspiring trod you climb from nature to the throne of god so saw the patriarch with admiring eyes from earth to heaven a golden ladder rise involved in clouds the mystic scale ascends and brutes and angels crowd the distant ends trinity college cambridge january first seventeen ninety four end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Jumias's Wisdom by Epicharmus, 550 to 460 BC. Read for LibriVox.org. Jumias's Wisdom? Not a scanty gift appropriated to one single being, but every animal that breathes and lives has mind and intellect so if you will survey the facts attentively you'll find e'en in the common poultry-yard 
the hen brings not her offspring forth at first alive but sits upon her eggs and by her warmth cherishes them into life and all this wisdom she does derive from nature's gift alone for nature is her only guide and teacher there is no wonder in my teaching this that citizens please citizens and seem to one another to be beautiful and so one dog seems to another dog the fairest object in the world and so one ox seems to another ass to ass and swine to swine End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Flowers in the Cemetery by Hannah Flagg Gold. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Flowers in the Cemetery. Peace keeps the place where we spring up and bloom. Kind, gentle angels hover round to spread our tender leaves and bowers by the tomb to pour our freshest odors over the dead soft silent air supplies our vital breath it wafts no sound of tumult mirth or strife where for the mourners in the land of death beneath his throne we open into life praise to our maker is the holy part assigned to us and while his power we show with soothing skill to reach the stricken heart a while to lull the throbbing pulse of woe we to the eye that on our native sod retires unseen to shed the dew of grief attest the presence of a perfect god whose glory shines on every opening leaf who then our beauty can behold nor feel something not sadness but to joy allied upon the wounded bosom sweetly steal like balm by spirit ministers applied tell us ye sad ones if it be not thus do ye not own this soothing art is ours when ye come out to breathe your sighs to us and count your sorrows to your cherished flowers here do ye find us steady to our trust as sentinels who stand to guard the dead each has her charge to watch the sacred dust of someone sleeping in the dreamless bed. Well is our high and solemn office done, since we were planted, not a foot has crossed a spot that we have pointed out as one where rests a friend that ye have loved and lost. Night falls around us like a mourner's veil, but though our beauties in the dimness fade, still does the pure free essence we exhale ascend and penetrate the deepest shade if thus the better part of those you weep from death and darkness rose to life and light then lift your hearts from all that earth could keep to that blessed world where you may reunite such is the part that we the humble flowers perform and such the solace we would give to men who while we bloom our few short hours has yet a whole eternity to live end of poem this recording is in the public domain fourth of july by julia ann moore read for LibriVox.org by m lee fourth of july how sweet it sounds as every year it rolls around it brings active joy to boy and man this glorious day throughout our land we hail this day with joy and pride and speak of our forefathers who died who fought for liberty in days of yore and drove the british from our shore we as descendants of that race should not now our land disgrace arise free man arise once more be earnest as in the days of yore End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gulls by Leonora Spire Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Fearless riders of the gale, In your bleak eyes is the memory of sinking ships. Desire unsatisfied droops from your wings. 
You lie at dusk in the sea's ebbing cradles, unresponsive to its mother mood, or hover and swoop, snatching your food and rising again, greedy, unthanking. You veer and steer your callous course, unloved of other birds, and in your soulless cry is the mocking echo of woman's weeping in the night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hag by Robert Herrick Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gauntz The hag is astride this night for to ride the devil and she together through thick and through thin, now out and then in, though ne'er so foul be the weather. A thorn or a burr she takes for a spur, with a lash of a bramble she rides now. Through brakes and through briars, or ditches and mires, she follows the spirit that guides now. No beast for his food dares now range in the wood, but hushed in his lair he lies lurking while mischiefs by these on land and on seas at noon of night are working. The storm will arise and trouble the skies this night and more for the wonder. The ghost from the tomb affrighted shall come, called out by the clap of the thunder. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Himself by Theodosia Pickering Garrison Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson The household that we were then, you could count us by the dozens. The wonder was that sometimes the old walls wouldn't burst. Herself, the Lord be good to her, the aunts and rafts of cousins, the young folks and the children, but himself came first. Master of the house he was, and well for them that knew it his cheeks like winter apples and his head like snow eyes as blue as water when the sun of march shines through it and stepping like a soldier with his stick held so faith he could tell a tale would serve a man for wages sing a song would put the joy of dancing in two sticks but saints between themselves and harm that saw him in his rages blazing and orating over chess and politics master of the house he was and that beyond all saying eh the times i've heard him exhorting from his chair the like of any bishop yet snappin off his prayin to put the curse on feelin's dog for howlin in the prayer the times i've seen him walkin out like solomon in glory salutin with great elegance the gentry he might meet an eye for every pretty girl an ear for every story and taken as his just deserts the middle of the street master of the house with much to love and be forgiven yet thinking of himself to-day himself i see him go with that old light step of his across the courts of heaven his hat a little sideways and his stick held so end of poem this recording is in the public domain Hymn to the Belly by Ben Johnson Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf Room, room, make room for the bouncing belly, First father of sauce and divisor of jelly, Prime master of arts and giver of wit, That found out the excellent engine, the spit, The plow and the flail, the mill and the hopper, The hutch and the bolter, the furnace and copper, the oven, the bavin, the mockin, the peel, the hearth and the range, the dog and the wheel. He, he first invented the hogshead and ton, the gimlet and vice too, and taught him to run. And since, with the funnel and hypocris bag, he's made of himself that now he cries swag. Which shows, though the pleasure be but of four inches, yet he is a weasel, the gullet that pinches of any delight 
and not spares from his back whatever to make of the belly a sack hail hail plump paunch o oh, the founder of taste for fresh meats or powdered or pickled or paste devourer of broiled baked roasted or sawed and emptier of cups be they even or odd all which have now made thee so wide in the waist as scarce with no pudding thou art to be laced but eating and drinking until thou dost nod thou breakst all thy girdles and breaks forth a god in the poem this recording is in the public domain and him to the morning by phyllis wheatley read for librivox dot org by m lee attend my lays ye ever honoured nine assist my labours and my strains refine in smoothest numbers pour the notes along for bright aurora now demands my song aurora hail and all the thousand dyes which deck thy progress through the vaulted skies the morn awakes and wide extends her rays on every leaf the gentle zephyr plays harmonious lays the feathered race resume dart the bright eye and shake the painted plume ye shady groves your verdant gloom display to shield your poet from the burning day calliope awake the sacred lyre while thy fair sisters fan the pleasing fire the bowers the gales the variegated skies in all their pleasures in my bosom rise see in the east the illustrious king of day his rising radiance drives the shades away but oh i feel his fervid beams too strong and scarce begun concludes the abortive song end of poem this recording is in the public domain i broke the spell that held me long by william cullen bryant Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. I broke the spell that held me long, the dear, dear witchery of song. I said, The poet's idle lore shall waste my prime of years no more. For poetry, though heavenly born, consorts with poverty and scorn. I broke the spell, nor deemed its power could fetter me another hour. Ah, thoughtless! how could i forget its causes were around me yet for wheresoever i looked the while was nature's everlasting smile still came and lingered on my sight of flowers and streams the bloom and light and glory of the stars and sun and these and poetry are one they ere the world had held me long recalled me to the love of song End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If I Should Die by Ben King Read for LibriVox.org by Laiba Noor If I should die tonight And you should come to my cold corpse and say Weeping and heartsing over my lifeless clay if i should die to-night and you should come in deepest grief and woe and say here the ten dollars that i owe i might arise in my large white cravat and say what's that if i should die to-night and you should come to my cold curbs and kneel clasping my bier to show the grief you feel i say if i should die to-night and you should come to me and there and then just even hint about paying me that ten i might arise the while but i would drop dead again end of poem this recording is in the public domain jerusalem by william blake Red for nibberfox.org by chad horner located in ballyclare county antrim northern ireland and did those feet in ancient time walk upon england's mountains green and was the holy lamb of god on england's pleasant pastures seen and did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills 
and was Jerusalem builded here, among these dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds enfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Kindness by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Mike Overby, Midland, Washington Was he not kind to you this dead old year? Did he not give you enough of earthly store? Enough of laughter and good cheer? Is it not well to hate him for the pain he brought you and the sorrows manifold? To pardon him these hurts still I am fain, for in the panting period of his reign, he brought me new wounds, but he healed the old. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Legend of Gold by Charles Hamilton Musgrove Read for LibriVox.org by Tristan Mazurek Lucifer craved one boon of God after his fall as his own to hold. So he gave him a might in heaven's sight, but lo, the gift that he gave was gold. And Lucifer wrought with the rugged ore, till he fashioned it wondrous fair, and then he set a price on the precious store, and the price was the blood and tears of men. Blood and tears, and the price was paid. Blood was nothing, and tears were free. And Lucifer smiled at the fools and said, Surely your souls should belong to me. So he offered the earth with its golden heart, and the seas with their fleets from pole to pole. And they looked with lust on the worldwide mart, and said in their hearts it is worth the soul. And kings were they, and they ruled right well, gorgeously sped their sovereign day. But Lucifer hath their souls in hell, and their gold and their empires, where are they? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Liberated Convict by Lydia Howard Sigourney Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Liberated Convict Dark prison dome, farewell. How slow the hours have told their leaden march within thy walls. Toil claimed the day and stern remorse the night, and every season with a frowning face approached and went unreconciled away. Ah, who with virtue's pure unblenching soul can tell how tardily old time doth move, when guilt and punishment have clogged his wings? The winter of the soul, the frozen brow of unpolluted friends, the harrowing pangs of the lost prayer learned at the mother's knee, the uptorn hope, the violated vow, the poignant memory of unuttered things, do dwell, dark dome, with him who dwells with thee. And yet, thou place of woe, I would not speak too harshly of thee, since in thy sad cell repentance found me, and did steep with tears my lonely pillow, till the heart grew soft and spread itself in brokenness before the eye of mercy. Now, my penal doom completed, justice with an angel's face unbars her dreary gate. But when I view once more my home, when mild, forgiving eyes shall beam upon me, and the long-lost might of freedom nerve my arm, may the strong lines of that hard lesson sin hath taught my soul, gleam like a flaming beacon. God of heaven, who not for our infirmities or crimes dost turn thy face away, gird thou my soul, and fortify its purpose, so to run its future pilgrim race, as not to lose the sinner's ransom at the bar of doom. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Life by Charlotte Bronte, read for LibriVox.org, by Hiranmai. 
Life, believe, is not a dream so dark as sages say. Oft a little morning rain foretells a pleasant day. Sometimes there are clouds of gloom, but these are transient all. If the shower will make the roses bloom, a while lament is fall. Rapidly, merrily, life's sunny hours flit by. Gratefully, cheerily, enjoy them as they fly. What though death at times steps in and calls our best away? What though sorrow seems to win over hope a heavy sway? Yet hope again elastic springs, unconquered. Though she fell, still buoyant are her golden wings, still strong to bear as well. Manfully, fearlessly, the day of trial bear, for gloriously, victoriously, can courage quell despair. End of poem. The recording is in public domain. Locane Laun by Francis Brett Young Read for LibriVox.org by Edmund Agabau This is the image of my last content. My soul shall be a little lonely lake, so hidden that no shadow of man may break the folding of its mountain battlement. Only the beautiful and innocent whiteness of sea-born cloud drooping to shake cool rain upon the reed beds, or the wake of churned cloud in a howling wind's descent. For there shall be no terror in the night when stars that I have loved are born in me, and cloudy darkness I will hold most fair. But this shall be the end of my delight, that you, my lovely one, may stoop and see your image in the mirrored beauty there. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love and Philosophy by George Rund Jackson Read for LibriVox.org Love and Philosophy T'was a maiden full of knowledge, though she'd scarcely passed eighteen. She was lovely as an angel, though of grave and sober mien. A sweet encyclopedia of every kind of lore, and love looked coyly from behind the glasses that she wore. She sat beside her lover, with her elbow on his knee, and dreamily she gazed upon the slumbering summer sea, until he broke the silence, saying, Pray inform me, dear, what people mean when speaking of the thickness of the here. I know you're just from Concord, where the lights of wisdom be, your head crammed full to burst in love with their philosophy those grave and reverend sages and maids of hosiery blue then solve me the conundrum dear that i have put to you the maid replied with gravity the thingness of the here is that which lies between the past and future time my dear indeed the maid continued with a calm unruffled brow the thingness of the here is just the thisness of the now the lover smiled a loving smile and then he fondly placed a manly and protected arm around the maiden's waist and on her rosebud lips impressed a warm and loving kiss and said that's what i call my dear the nowness of the this end of poem this recording is in the public domain Love Walks with Humanity Yet by J. C. Manning Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Though toilers for gold stain their souls in a strife that enslaves them to avarice grim, though tyranny's hand fills the wine-cup of life with gall surging over the brim, though might in dark hatefulness reigns for a time, and right by wrong's frownings be met, love lives a guest angel from heaven's far clime and walks with humanity yet and still the world balaam like blind as the night sees not the fair seraph stand by that beckons it onward to morning and light lark-like from the sod to the sky love slighted smiles on 
as the thorn crowned of old sun featured and godlike in might its magic touch changing life's dross into gold earth's darkness to paradise bright as gems on death's fingers flash up from the tomb and rays o'er its loneliness shed as flowerets in early spring trembling bloom ere winter's cold ice breath has fled so love rainbow-like smiles through sadness and tears bridging up from the earth to the sky the grave neath its glance a bright blossom robe wears as the night smiles when morn dances by the rich mellow sunshine that kisses the earth the flowers that laugh up from the sod the songbirds that psalm out their jubilant mirth heart wrapped in the presence of god the sweet purling brooklet the voice soft and low the sea shouts like peals from above the sky kissing mountains the valleys below all tell us to live and to love end of poem this recording is in the public domain lucifer in starlight by george meredith read for librivox dot org by chad horner located in ballyclare county antrim northern ireland on a starred night prince lucifer uprose tired of his dark dominion swung the fiend above the rolling ball in cloud part screened where sinners hugged their sceptre of repose purr prey to his hot fit of pride were those and now upon his western wing he leaned now his huge bulk o'er afric's sands careened now the black planet shadowed arctic snows soaring through wider zones that pricked his scars with memory of the old revolt from awe he reached a middle height and at the stars which are the brain of heaven he looked and sank around the ancient track marched rank on rank the army of unutterable law end of poem this recording is in the public domain Mine Host by John McRae, recorded for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gauntz. There stands a hostel by a travelled way, life is the road and death the worthy host. Each guest he greets, nor ever lacks to say, how have ye fared? They answer him the most, this lodging place is other than we sought. We had intended farther, but the gloom came on apace, and found us ere we thought. Yet we will lodge, thou hast abundant room. Within sit haggard men that speak no word. No fire gleams their cheerful welcome shed, No voice of fellowship or strife is heard, But silence of a multitude of dead. Naught can I offer ye, quoth death, but rest, And to his chamber leads each tired guest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mishka by John Gray Recorded for LibriVox.org by Julian Prattley to Henri Teixeira de Matos. Mishka is poet among the beasts, when roots are rotten and rivers weep. The bear is at play in the land of sleep, though his head be heavy between his fists. The bear is poet among the beasts. The Dream Wide and large are the monster's eyes, naught saying save one word alone, Mishka. Mishka as turned to stone, hears no word else, nor in any wise can see aught save the monster's eyes. Honey is under the monster's lips, and Mishka follows into her lair, dragged in the net of her yellow hair, knowing all things when honey drips, on his tongue like rain the song of the hips, of the honey child, and of each twin mound. Mishka, there screamed a far bird note, deep in the sky, when round his throat the triple coil of her hair she wound and stroked his limbs with a humming sound. Mishka is white like a hunter's son, tore he knows no more of the ancient south, when the honey child's lips are on his mouth, when all her kisses are joined in one, and his body is bathed in grass and sun. The shadows lie moven beneath the trees, and purple stains where the finches pass, leap in the stalks of the deep rank grass. Flutter of wing and the buzz of bees deepen the silence and sweeten ease. The honey child is an olive tree, the voice of birds and the voice of flowers, each of them all and all the hours. The honey child is a winged bee, her touch is a perfume, a melody. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. Mountain Lion by D. H. Lawrence, read for LibriVox.org by Jedediah Smith. Mountain Lion, climbing through the January snow, into the Lobo Canyon, dark grow the spruce trees, blue is the balsam, water sounds still unfrozen, and the trail is still evident. Men, two men, men the only animal in the world to fear. They hesitate. We hesitate. They have a gun. We have no gun. Then we all advance to meet two Mexicans, strangers, emerging out of the dark and snow and inwardness of the Lobo Valley. What are they doing here on this vanishing trail? What is he carrying? Something yellow. A deer? Que tiene, amigo? Leon. He smiles, foolishly, as if he were caught doing wrong. And we smile, foolishly, as if we didn't know. He is quite gentle and dark-faced. It is a mountain lion, a long, long, slim cat, yellow like a lioness, dead. He trapped her this morning, he says, smiling foolishly. Lift up her face, her round, bright face, bright as frost, her round, fine-fashioned head with two dead ears, and stripes in the brilliant frost of her face, sharp, fine, dark rays, dark, keen, fine rays in the brilliant frost of her face, beautiful, dead eyes. Hermoso es! They go out towards the open. We go on into the gloom of Lobo. And above the trees I found her lair, a hole in the blood-orange brilliant rocks that stick up, a little cave, and bones, and twigs, and a perilous ascent. So she will never leap up that way again, with the yellow flash of a mountain lion's long shoot and her bright striped frost face will never watch any more out of the shadow of the cave in the blood-orange rock above the trees of the lobo dark valley mouth. Instead, I look out, and out to the dim of the desert, like a dream never real, to the snow of the Sangre de Cristo mountains, the ice of the mountains of Picorus, and near across, at the opposite steep of snow, green trees, motionless, standing in snow like a Christmas toy. And I think, in this empty world, there was room for me and a mountain lion. And I think in the world beyond, how easily we might spare a million or two of humans and never miss them. Yet what a gap in the world! the missing white frost face of that slim yellow mountain lion. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Heart by Nicolas Lino Translated by Charles Wharton Stock Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Sleepless night, the rushing rain, While my heart with ceaseless pain Hears the mournful past subsiding, Or the uncertain future striding. Heart, tis fatal thus to hearken, Let not fear thy courage darken, Though the past be all regretting, And the future helpless fretting, Onward, let what's mortal die, Is the storm near, beat thou high, Who came safe o'er Galilee, Makes the voyage now in thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Nebulous Philosophy by J. Edgar Jones Read for LibriVox.org Nebulous Philosophy She came from Concord's classic shades, On reason's throne she sat, And wove intricate arguments to prove, In language pat, The witchness of the wherefore, And the thusness of the that she scorned in noble subjects each groveling household care but turned her lofty soul to prove the airness of the air and twisted skeins of logic round the whatness of the where to lower nature's leaving the dollars and the sense she soared above the level of commonplace pretence and moulded treatises which proved the thatness of the thence her glorious purpose to reveal the thinkfulness of the thought to trace each line by somewhat on the somehow surface wrought to picture forms of why nots from the what nots meaning caught to cultivate our spirits with the why for's classic flow to benefit the thereness with the highness of the how to flood the dark with radiance from the thisness of the now what good has she accomplished oh never doubt her thus it must be useful to reveal the plusness of the plus to illustrate with corkscrew words the witchness of the us mark not poor common mortal when thoughts like these appear illumining our labor with the howness of the here and blazing like a comet through the nowness of the near some day in realms eternal such grand mist haunted souls inscribe their words of witchness on wherefore antic scrolls in that great world of muchness which through the maybe rolls then shall we each acknowledge the wyness of the whence each understand completely with sensefulness of sense the thusness of the therefore the thatness of the thence End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? By William Knox. Read for LibriVox.org by Charlie Joseph. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? Like a swift fitting meteor, a fast flying cloud a flash of the lightning, a break of the wave, he passeth from life to his rest in the grave. The leaves of the oak and the willow shall fade, be scattered around and together be laid, as the young and the old, the low and the high, shall crumble to dust and together shall lie. The child that a mother attended and loved, the mother that infant's affection who proved, the husband that mother, an infant who blessed, each all are away to the dwellings of rest. The maid on whose brow, on whose cheek, in whose eye, shown beauty and pleasure, her triumphs are by, and alike from the minds of the living erased are the memories of mortals who loved her and praised. The hand of the king that the sceptre hath borne, the brow of the priest that the mitre hath worn, the eyes of the sage and the heart of the brave are hidden and lost in the depths of the grave. The peasant whose lot was to sow and to reap, the herdsman who climbed with his goats up the steep, the beggar who wandered in search of his bread, have faded away like the grass that we tread. The saint who enjoyed the communion of heaven, the sinner who dared to remain unforgiven, the wise and the foolish, the guilty and just, have quietly mingled their bones in the dust. So the multitude goes like the flower of weed that withers away to let others succeed. So the multitude comes, even those we behold, to repeat every tale that has often been told. For we are the same things our fathers have been. We see the same sights our fathers have seen. We drink the same stream. We feel the same sun and run the same course our fathers have run. The thoughts we are thinking, our fathers did think. From the death we are shrinking, our fathers did shrink. To the life we are clinging, our fathers did cling. But it speeds from us all, like the bird on the wing. 
They loved, but the story we cannot unfold. They scorned, but the heart of the haughty is cold. They grieved, but no wail from their slumbers will come. They joyed, but the tongue of their gladness is dumb. They died, ah, they died. We, things that are now, that walk on the turf that lies over their brow, and make in their dwellings a transient abode, meet the changes they met on their pilgrimage road. Yeah, hope and despondency, pleasure and pain, are mingled together in sunshine and rain, and the smile and the tear, the song and the dirge, still follow each other like surge upon surge. Tis the wink of an eye, tis the draught of a breath, from the blossom of health to the paleness of death, from the gilded saloon to the bier and the shroud. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On Poet Ape by Ben Johnson. Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. Poor poet ape, that would be thought our chief, whose works are e'en the frippery of wit, from brokage is become so bold a thief, as we, the robbed, leave rage and pity it. At first he made low shifts, would pick and glean by the reversion of old plays. Now grown to a little wealth, and credit in the scene, he takes up all, makes each man's wit his own, and, told of this, he slights it. Tut! Such crimes the sluggish gaping auditor devours. He marks not whose twas first, and after times may judge it to be his as well as ours. Fool! As if half eyes will not know a fleece from locks of wool or shreds from the whole piece. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On Talking by Khalil Gibran. Read for LibriVox.org by Chad Horner. And then a scholar said, Speak of talking. And he answered, saying, You talk when you cease to be at peace with your thoughts, and when you can no longer dwell in the solitude of your heart. You live in your lips, and sound is a diversion and a pastime. And in much of your talking, thinking is half murdered, for thought is a bird of space that in a cage of words may indeed unfold its wings but cannot fly. There are those among you who seek the talkative through fear of being alone. The silence of aloneness reveals to their eyes their naked selves as they would escape. And there are those who talk and without knowledge or forethought reveal a truth which they themselves do not understand. And there are those who have the truth within them, but they tell it not in words. In the bosom of such as these, the spirit dwells in rhythmic silence. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Oread by Hilda Doolittle. Read for LibriVox.org by Peter O'Donovan. Oread. Whirl up sea. Whirl your pointed pines. Splash your great pines on our rocks. Hurl your green over us. Cover us with your pools of fur. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O Ship of State by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Jedediah Smith O Ship of State Thou too sail on, O Ship of State, Sail on, O Union, strong and great, Humanity with all its fears, With all the hopes of future years, Is hanging breathless on thy fate. We know what master laid the keel, What workman wrought thy ribs of steel, Who made each mast and sail and rope, What anvils rang, what hammers beat, In what a forge and what a heat, were shaped the anchors of thy hope. Fear not each sudden sound and shock, 
Tis of the wave and not the rock. Tis but the flapping of the sail, And not a rent made by the gale. In spite of rock and tempest's roar, In spite of false lights on the shore, Sail on, nor fear to breast the sea. Our hearts, our hopes, are all with thee. Our hearts, our hopes, our prayers, our tears, Our faith triumphant o'er our fears, Are all with thee, are all with thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Oxen by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher Christmas Eve and Twelve of the Clock Now they are all on their knees, an elder said as we sat in a flock, by the embers in hearthside ease. We pictured the meek, mild creatures where they dwelt in their strawy pen, nor did it occur to one of us there to doubt they were kneeling then. So fair a fancy few would weave in these years. Yet I feel if someone said on Christmas Eve, Come, see the oxen kneel, In the lonely barton by yonder coom Our childhood used to know, I should go with him in the gloom, Hoping it might be so. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ozymandias by Horace Smith Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher In Egypt's sandy silence, all alone, stands a gigantic leg which far off throws the only shadow that the desert knows. I am great Ozymandias, saith the stone, the king of kings. This mighty city shows the wonders of my hand. The city is gone. Naught but the leg remaining to disclose the site of this forgotten Babylon. We wonder, and some hunter may express wonder like ours, when through the wilderness where London stood, holding the wolf in chase, he meets some fragment huge, and stops to guess what powerful but unrecorded race once dwelt in that annihilated place. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Passionate Shepherd to His Love by Christopher Marlow Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Kennedy Come live with me and be my love, And we will all the pleasures prove That valleys, groves, hills, and fields, Woods or steepy mountain, yields. And we will sit upon the rocks, Seeing the shepherds feed their flocks, By shallow rivers to whose falls Melodious birds sing madrigals, and I will make thee beds of roses, and a thousand fragrant posies, a cap of flowers, and a kirtle, embroidered all with leaves of myrtle, a gown made of the finest wool, which from our pretty lambs we pull, fair lined slippers for the cold with buckles of the purest gold. A belt of straw and ivy buds, with coral clasps and amber studs. And if these pleasures may thee move, come live with me and be my love. The shepherd's swain shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. If these delights 
thy mind may move, then live with me and be my love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Nymphs Reply to the Shepherd by Sir Walter Raleigh Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Kennedy If all the world and love were young, and truth in every shepherd's tongue, these pretty pleasures might me move to live with thee and be thy love. Time drives the flocks from field to fold, when rivers rage and rocks grow cold. And Philomel becometh dumb, the rest complains of cares to come. The flowers do fade, and wanton fields to wayward winter reckoning yields. A honey tongue, a heart of gall, is fancy's spring, but sorrow's fall. Thy gowns, thy shoes, thy beds of roses, thy cap, thy kirtle, and thy posies. Soon break, soon wither, soon forgotten. In folly, ripe. In reason, rotten. Thy belt of straw and ivy buds, Thy coral claps and somber studs, All these in me no means can move To come to thee and be thy love. But could youth last and love still breed, Had joys no date nor age, no need, then these delights my mind might move to live with thee and be thy love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pain is a Treasure from the Mesnavi of Jalaladina Rumi, translated by E. H. Winfield. Read for LibriVox.org by Daniel Davison Pain is a treasure Pain is a treasure, for it contains mercies. The kernel is soft when the rind is scraped off. O oh, brother, the place of darkness and cold is the fountain of life and the cup of ecstasy. So also is endurance of pain and sickness and disease. For from abasement proceeds exaltation. The spring seasons are hidden in the autumns, and the autumns are charged with springs. End of Pain is a Treasure by Jalaladina Rumi. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Penance by John McRae. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gantz My lover died a century ago, her dear heart stricken by my slanderous breath, wherefore the gods forbade that I should know the peace of death. Men pass my grave and say twere well to sleep like such an one amid the uncaring dead. How should they know the vigils that I keep, the tears I shed? Upon the grave I count with lifeless breath Each night, each year, the flowers that bloom and die, Deeming the leaves that fall to dreamless death More blessed than I. T'was just last year I heard two lovers pass So near I caught the tender words he said. Tonight the rain-drenched breezes sway the grass above his head. That night full envious of his life was I That youth and love should stand at his behest. Tonight I envy him that he should lie at utter rest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Plea by Edgar Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Corey Jaffone God grant me these, the strength to do some needed service here the wisdom to be brave and true, the gift of vision clear, that in each task that comes to me some purpose I may plainly see. God, teach me to believe that I am stationed at a post, although the humblest neath the sky, 
where I am needed most, and that, at last, if I do well, my humble services will tell. God grant me faith to stand on guard, uncheered, unspoke, alone, and see behind such duty hard my service to the throne. Whate'er my task, this be my creed. I am on earth to fill a need. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Prayer by Nicolas Linau Translated by Charles Wharton Stork Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Eye of darkness, dim dominioned, stay, enchant me with thy might. Earnest, gentle, dreamy pinioned, sweet, unfathomable night. With magician's mantle cover all this day world from my sight, that for I thy form may hover o'er my being, lovely night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Return by Ezra Pound. Read for LibriVox.org by Peter O'Donovan. The Return. See, they return. Ah, see the tentative movements and the slow feet, the trouble and the pace and the uncertain wavering. See, they return, one and by one, with fear, as half-awakened, as if the snow should hesitate, and murmur in the wind, and half-turn back. These were the winged with awe, inviolable, gods of the winged shoe, with them the silver hound sniffing the trace of air. Hai, hai, these were the swift to harry, these the keen-scented, these were the souls of blood, slow on the leash, pallid the leashman. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Saturday on the Farm by Edwin C. Rank Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Tis Saturday morn, and all is bright by nature's own endowing. The sun is fiercely giving light, and only me ploughing. Across the river I hear the sound of a boatman slowly rowing. I have no time to fool around, especially when I'm hoeing. And when the dinner hour has come, and thoughts of work are fleeting, I only hear the insects hum, because I'm busy eating. At night, when all things are at rest, safe in old Morpheus keeping, no troubles do my mind infest, for I am soundly sleeping. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Seattle by Gustav Melby Read for LibriVox.org by Mike Overby, Midland, Washington Thou princess of the sea, how thou hast grown Since last I saw thee, and how beautiful The ocean breezes must to thee have blown The ardent health which nothing wrong could dull The blood of races mingling in thy veins the spirit of two worlds have met in thee, Most genial and free, thou here dost reign, A charming princess of the western sea. It was with thee I did a year abide, A year so antithetically mixed, When painful doubts forbade me to confide, And life's career, confessed, still was unfixed. Maybe it was thy spirit which I felt, that gave me song and oriental dreams, and when in occidental shrines I knelt, of oriental truth there came bright gleams. And hath not doubts been harassing my soul, and had I shunned to give a heed to fears, 
but followed, like thyself, the Spirit's call. How different had been the lapsing years. Perhaps I then, with glory now, could meet the growth in life I see on every hand. But now I sit in sorrow at thy feet and find my name was written in the sand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Shadow in Harvest by Josephine Kermode, writing as Cushag. Read for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon. Hushed is the harvest field that so lately resounded with mirth, for the gathering in of the harvest and the joy of the fruits of the earth. Hushed is the song of the reapers, for lo, in the midst of their toil, another reaper has entered to gather in his spoil. A fall from a loaded wagon, a still form lying there, the bright gay tune he was whistling still throbbing in the air. Alas for the news they are bearing to the white house under the trees, where the wife, who will soon be a widow, is nursing their babe on her knees. Baby, she sings, my baby, daddy will come to us soon, daddy will come for the milia, and will dance by the light of the moon. What do you see, my darling, and why that sudden frown? It is only a shadow, my darling, for the sun is going down. How shall they bear to ruin that pretty baby play? How shall they dare to tell her what they must so quickly say? A trembling hand on the gate, one look in her startled face, no need for spoken words. God help her of his grace. Like a lapwing over the meadow, she's flown to her wounded mate. One broken sob, then steady. The tears can be made to wait. What wrecks she how it happened, or where the fault may lie? She only knows that the sunshine is all gone out of her sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Singers to Come by Alice Maynell. Read for LibriVox.org by Teresa Spencer. New delights to our desire the singers of the past can yield. I lift mine eyes to hill and field and see in them your yet dumb lyre, poets unborn and unrevealed. Singers to come, what thoughts will start to song? What words of yours be sent through man's soul and with earth be blent? These words of nature and the heart await you like an instrument. Who knows what musical flocks of words upon these pine tree tops will light and crown these towers in circling flight and cross these seas like summer birds and give a voice to the day and night? Something of you already is ours. Some mystic part of you belongs to us whose dream of your future throngs, who look on hills and trees and flowers which will mean so much in your songs. I wonder, like the maid who found and knelt to lift the lyre supreme of Orpheus from the Thracian stream. She dreams on its sealed past profound, on a deep future sealed I dream. She bears it in her wanderings within her arms, and has not pressed her unskilled fingers but her breast upon those silent sacred strings. I too clasp mystic strings at rest. For I, i the world of lands and seas, the sky of wind and rain and fire, and in man's world of long desire, in all that is yet dumb in these, have found a mysterious liar. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet One by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Garfield D'Souza. From fairest creatures we desire increase that thereby beauty's rose might never die. But as a riper should by time decease, his tender air might bear his memory. But thou, contracted to thine own bright eyes, feedest thy light's flame with self-substantial fuel, making a famine where abundance lies, thyself thy fall, to thy sweet self too cruel. 
Thou that art now the world's fresh ornament, and only herald to the gaudy spring, within thine own bud buriest thy content, and tender churl makes waste in niggarding. Pity the world, or else this glutton be, to eat the world's dew, by the grave and thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 2 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Garfield D'Souza When forty winters shall besiege thy brow, And dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, Thy youth's proud livery so gazed on now Will be a tattered weed of small worth held. Then being asked where all thy beauty lies, Where all the treasure of thy lusty days, to say within thine own deep sunken eyes, were an all eating shame and thriftless praise. How much more praise deserved thy beauty's use, if thou couldst answer, This fair child of mine shall sum my count and make my old excuse, proving his beauty by succession thine. This were to be new made when thou art old, and see thy blood warm when thou feelest it cold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 3 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Garfield D'Souza Look in thy glass and tell the face thou viewest. Now is the time that face should form another, whose fresh repair, if now thou not renewest, Thou thus beguile the world, unbless some mother. For where is she so fair, whose unheard womb disdains the tillage of thy husbandry? Or who is he so fond will be the doom of his self-love to stop posterity? Thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. So thou through windows of thine age shall see, Despite of wrinkles, this thy golden time. But if thou live, remembered not to be, Die single, and thine image dies with thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ah, Sweet Mystery of Life by Rita Johnson Young Read for LibriVox.org by Edmund Agabau. Ah, sweet mystery of life, at last I've found thee. Ah, I know at last the secret of it all, all the longing, striving, seeking, waiting, yearning, the burning hopes, the joys, and idle tears that fall. For tis love, and love alone, the world is seeking, and it's love and love alone, that can reply. Tis the answer, tis the end and all of living, for it is love alone that rules for I. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sycophantic Fox and the Gullible Raven by Guy Whitmore Carroll, read for LibriVox.org by Bookworm360. The Sycophantic Fox and the Gullible Raven A raven sat upon a tree, and not a word he spoke for. His beak contained a piece of brie, or maybe it was roquefort. We'll make it any kind you please. At all events, it was a cheese. Beneath the tree's umbrageous limb, a hungry fox sat smiling. He saw the raven watching him, and spoke in tones beguiling. Jadmir, said he, tombeau plumage, the which was simply persiflage. Two things there are, no doubt you know, to which a fox is used, a rooster that is bound to crow, a crow that's bound to roost, and whichsoever he espies, he tells the most unblushing lies. Sweet fowl, he said, I understand you're more than merely natty. I hear you sing to beat the band and Adelina Paddy. Pray render with your liquid tongue a bit from Gotterdammerung. 
This subtle speech was aimed to please the crow, and it succeeded. He thought no bird in all the trees could sing as well as he did. In flattery completely doused, he gave the jewel song from Faust. But gravitation's law, of course, as Isaac Newton showed it, exerted on the cheese its force and elsewhere soon bestowed it. In fact, there is no need to tell what happened when to earth it fell. I blush to add that when the bird took in the situation, he said one brief emphatic word, unfit for publication. The fox was greatly startled, but he only sighed and answered, tut. The moral is, a fox is bound to be a shameless sinner, and also when the cheese comes round, you know it's after dinner. But what is only known to few, the fox is after dinner too. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Taxi by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Peter O'Donovan The Taxi When I go away from you, the world beats dead like a slackened drum. I call out for you against the jutted stars and shout into the ridges of the wind. Streets coming fast, one after the other, wedge you away from me, and the lamps of the city prick my eyes so that I can no longer see your face. Why should I leave you to wound myself upon the sharp edges of the night? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Things Worthwhile by Edwin C. Rank Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Gachock To sit and dream in a shady nook While the phantom clouds roll by To con some long-remembered book When the pulse of youth beats high To thrill when the dying sunset glows Through the heart of a mystic wood to drink the sweetness of some wild rose, and to find the whole world good, to bring unto others joy and mirth, and keep what friends you can, to learn that the rarest gift on earth is the love of your fellow man, to hold the respect of those you know, to scorn dishonest pelf, to sympathize with another's woe, and just be true to yourself to find that a woman's honest love in this great world of strife gleams steadfast like a star above the dark morass of life to feel a baby's clinging hand to watch a mother's smile to dwell once more in fairyland these are the things worth while End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The third ode of Amr, son of Kalmia, translated from the Arabic by Charles James Lyle. Read for LibriVox.org by Daniel Davison. The third ode of Amr ibn Kalmia. Preliminary note by the translator. This piece has lost its prelude with the double rhyme. Verses 1 to 6, in his old age the poet recalls his former prowess as a raider. After verse 6, there is probably a lacuna in which the achievement of the raiders was described. Verses 7 and 8 are detached verses which must have belonged to a passage describing the poet's liberality in offering hospitality to strangers. Verses 9 to 15, an often cited lamentation over the decay due to old age. End of preliminary note. The Third Ode of Amr ibn Kamiya If now I have no longer the strength to take a great journey, how many noble companions have I led forth in time past? I said to them, Go on your way. May my mother's sister be your sacrifice. Feel ye not the wind that burns with summer heat? Then did they set themselves to the pale-colored camels whose flesh had been trained down to hardness, their pasterns bound round with thongs that tied on their shoes. And I betook myself to a stout she-camel, strong as a stallion, bulky, that answered my pulling tight her foregirth with a roaring. 
and I journeyed with them the night through to the rising of the sun, taking my way unerringly, although the darkness thereof was mixed with dust. And I brought them down to drink at a water just at the right time, where by reason of its remoteness and freedom from disturbance were gathered together a mixed multitude of sand grouse and doves. And the lightest hand of all in estimation that can never do thee any harm is the hand among other hands that is stretched into the vessel of food, whether the hand of a stranger or one of near kin, brought to thee by a violent north wind that blows the dust along. Now am I that have passed the space of ninety years as though on a day I had stripped off the cheek straps of my bridle. I raise myself painfully on three supports by the help of my hands and a staff, and after that I stand upright. The daughters of time have shot at me from a place which I could not see, and how should he fare who is shot at while he cannot shoot in reply? Yea, if it were an arrow that shot me, I could have defended myself against it, but I am shot with that which is not a shaft. When men see me, they say, Art thou not he, that but lately was bright with new arms and armour, no sluggish fighter? Yea, I perish, but of time I cannot kill even a knight, and that which I slay of him amounts not even to a thread for stringing beads upon. I am slain by looking forward to day and night, and looking onward to year after year. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Tiger by William Blake. Read for LibriVox.org by Bookworm360. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who make the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? End of The Tiger by William Blake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Jake by Eunice Tejans. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. You are turned wraith, your supple flitting hands, as formless as the night wind's moan, beckon across the years, and your heart's pain fades surely as a stained stone. And yet you will not let me rest, crying and calling down the night to me a thing that when your body moved and glowed, living, you could not make me see. Lean down your homely, mist-encircled head, close, close above my human ear, and tell me what of pain among the dead. Tell me, and I will try to hear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Memory of Ben Johnson by Jasper Main, read for LibriVox.org by Phil Shemp. As when the vestal hearth went out, no fire less holy than the flame that did expire could kindle it again. So at thy fall, our wit, great Ben, is too apocryphal to celebrate the loss, since tis too much to write thy epitaph and not be such what thou wert like the hard oracles of old without an ecstasy cannot be told we must be ravished first thou must infuse thyself into us 
both the theme and muse else though we all conspired to make thy hearse our works so that it had been but one great verse though the priest had translated for that time the liturgy and buried thee in rhyme so that in metre we had heard it said poetic dust is to poetic laid and though that dust being shakespeare's thou mightst not his room but the poet for thy grave so that as thou didst prince of numbers die and live so now thou mightst in numbers lie twere frail solemnity verses on thee and not like thine would but kind libels be and we not speaking thy whole worth should raise worse blots than they that envied thy praise indeed thou needst us not since above all invention thou wert thine own funeral hereafter when time hath fed on thy tomb the inscription worn out and the marble dumb so that twould pose a critic to restore half words and words expired so long before when thy maimed statue hath a sentenced face and looks that are the horror of the place that twill be learning in antiquity and ask us seldom to say this was thee thou'lt have a whole name still nor needst thou fear that will be ruined or lose nose or hair let others write so thin that they can't be authors till rotten no posterity can add to thy works they add their whole growth then when first born and came aged from thy pen whilst living thou enjoyedst the fame and sense of all that time gives but the reverence when thou art of homer's years no man will say thy poems are less worthy but more gray tis bastard poetry and oh the false blood which can't without succession be good things that will always last do thus agree with things eternal they at once perfect be scorn then their censures who gave tout thy wit as long upon a comedy did fit as elephants bring forth and that thy blots and mendings took more time than fortune plots that such thy drought was and so great thy thirst that all thy plays were drawn at the mermaid first that the king's yearly butt wrote and his wine hath more right than thou to thy cataline let such men keep a diet let their wit be racked and while they write suffer a fit when they've felt tortures which outpain the gout such as with less the state draws treason out though they should the length of consumptions lie sick of their verse and of their poem die twould not be the worst scene but would at last confirm their boastings and shew maiden haste he that writes well writes quick since the rule's true nothing is slowly done that's always new so when thy fox had ten times acted been each day was first but that twas cheaper seen and so thy alchemist played o'er and o'er was new o'er the stage when twas not at the door we like the actors did repeat the pit the first time saw the next conceived thy wit which was cast in those forms such rules such arts that but to some not half thy acts were parts since of some silken judgments we may say they filled a box two hours but saw no play so that the unlearned lost their money and scholars saved only that could understand thy seed was free from monsters no hard plot called down a god to untie the unlikely knot the stage was still a stage two entrances were not two parts of the world disjoined by seas thine were land tragedies no prince was found to swim a whole scene out then all the stage drowned pitched fields as red bull wars still felt thy doom thou laidst no sieges to the music room thou wouldst allow to thy best comedies humours that should above the people rise 
yet was thy language and thy style so high thy sock to the ankle buskin reached to the thigh and both so chaste so above dramatic clean that we both safely saw and lived thy scene no foul loose line did prostitute thy wit thou wrought'st thy comedies didst not commit we did the vice arraigned not tempting here and were made judges not bad parts by the ear for thou e'en sin didst in such words array that some who came bad parts went out good play which ended not with the epilogue the age still acted which grew innocent from the stage tis true thou hadst some sharpness but thy salt served but with pleasure to reform the fault men were laughed into virtue and none more hated face acted than were such before so did thy sting not blood but humours draw so much doth satire more correct than law which was not nature in thee as some call thy teeth who say thy wit lay in thy gall that thou didst quarrel first and then in spite didst gainst a person of such vices right that twas revenge not truth that on the stage carlo was not presented but thy rage and that when thou in company wert met thy meat took notes and thy discourse was net we know thy free vein had this innocence to spare the party and to brand the offence and the just indignation thou wert in did not expose shift but his tricks and gin thou mightst have used the old comic freedom these might have seen themselves played like socrates like cleon mammon might the knight have been if as greek authors thou hadst turned greek spleen and hadst not chosen rather to translate their learning into english not their rate indeed this last if thou hadst been bereft of thy humanity might be called theft the other was not whatsoe'er was strange or borrowed in thee did grow thine by the change who without latin helps hadst been as rare as beaumont fletcher or as shakespeare were and like them from thy native stock could say poets and kings are not born every day end of poem this recording is in the public domain towards break of day by william butler yeats read for LibriVox.org by edmund agabau was it the double of my dream the woman that by me lay dreamed or did we halve a dream under the first cold gleam of day i thought there is a waterfall upon ben bulbin's side that all my childhood counted dear were i to travel far and wide i could not find a thing so dear my memories had magnified so many times childish delight i would have touched it like a child but knew my finger could have touched cold stone and water i grew wild even accusing heaven because it had set down among its laws nothing that we love overmuch is ponderable to our touch i dreamed towards break of day the cold-blown spray in my nostril but she that beside me lay had watched in bitterer sleep the marvellous stag of arthur that lofty white stag leap from mountain steep to steep end of poem this recording is in the public domain the tragedian by zoe atkins read for librivox.org by laiba noor a storm is riding on the tide gray is the day and gray the tide far off the seagulls wheel and cry a storm draws near upon the tide a city lifts its minarets 
to winds that from the desert sweep and prisoned Arab women weep below the domes and minarets. Upon a hill in Thessaly stand broken columns in a line about a cold forgotten shrine beneath a moon in Thessaly. But in the world there is no place so desolate as your tragic face. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Transformation or The Tool and the Gem by Eliza R. Snow. Read for LibriVox.org by Wayne Cook. I saw a thing of rudest form from mountains base brought forth, a useless gem devoid of charm and wrapped in cumbrous earth. Its rough exterior met the eye with repulsive show, for every charm was forced to lie in buried depths below. The sculptor came. I wondered when his pliant tool was brought. He passed it o'er the gem, and then I marked the change it wrought. Each cumbrance from its surface cleared, the gem exposed to view, its nature and its worth appeared, its form expansive grew. By gentle strokes it was set free, by softer touch refined, till beauty, grace, and majesty were with its nature joined. Its luster kindled to a blaze, t'was wisdom's lamp begun and soon the splendor of its rays eclipsed the noonday sun. That gem was chained in crudeness, till the sculptor lent his aid. I wondered at the ready skill his potent hand displayed. It was the virtue of his tool, of fine transforming edge, which served for pencil, mold, and rule, for polisher and sledge. That tool requires a skillful hand, that gem no chain should bind, that tool is education, and that gem the human mind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Valediction Forbidding Morning by John Dunn Read for LibriVox.org by Emma Richardson As virtuous men pass mildly away And whisper to their souls to go Whilst some of their sad friends do say The breath goes now and some say no So let us melt and make no noise No tear floods nor sigh tempests move To a profanation of our joys To tell the lady of our love Moving of the earth brings harms and fears Men reckon what it did and meant the trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. Dull sublunary lovers love, whose soul is sense, cannot admit absence, because it doth remove those things which elemented it. But we, by a love so much refined, that ourselves know not what it is, interassured of the mind, care less, eyes, lips, and hands to miss. Our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go endure not yet a breach but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. If they be two, they are two so, as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. And though it in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as that comes home. Such will thou be to me, who must like the other foot obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just, and makes me end where I begun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Voice by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Manx. The Voice. Woman much missed. How you call to me, call to me saying that now you are not as you were when you had changed from the one who was all to me. 
but as at first, when our day was fair. Can it be you that I hear? Let me view you then, standing as when I drew near to the town where you would wait for me. Yes, as I knew you then, even to the original air-blue gown. Or is it only the breeze, in its listlessness travelling across the wet mead to me here? You being ever dissolved to one wistlessness, heard no more again, far or near. Thus I, faltering forward, leaves around me falling, wind oozing thin through the thorn from norward, and the woman calling. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wanderer by Zoe Akins, read for LibriVox.org by Hiranmai. The ships are lying in the bay, the gulls are swinging round their spars. My soul, as eagerly as they, desires the margin of the stars. So much do I love wandering, so much I love the sea and sky, that it will be a piteous thing in one small grave to lie. End of poem. The recording is in public domain. The Wands from Up by Josephine Kermode, writing as Cushag, read for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon. Mother, she said, when you're not by, there's little ones talking to me. They're showing me pictures out in the sky where the sun sets over the sea. Will I leave a piece of my supper, she said, and a drop of milk in the cup? Do you think it's fairies this in, she said? I'm thinking twas Wands from Up. Mother, she said, when the nights is long, there's little ones coming to me. They're bringing a harp and making a song and holding the light to see. I'll leave a bit of my supper, she said, and a taste of milk in the cup. I'm thinking it's fairies this in, she said. But I knew it was ones from up. Mother, she said, my head is sore, and the little ones is calling me. They say there's a boat waiting down at the shore to take me a sail on the sea. Keep by a piece of my supper, she said, and leave some milk in the cup. I'll go with the fairies a bit, she said, and she went to the ones from up. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Way Through the Woods by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher. They shut the road through the woods seventy years ago. Weather and rain have undone it again, and now you'd never know there was once a road through the woods before they planted the trees. It is underneath the coppice and heath and the thin anemones. Only the keeper sees that where the ring dove broods and the badgers roll at ease there was once a road through the woods. Yet if you enter the woods of a summer evening late, when the night air cools on the trout-ringed pools where the otter whistles his mate, they fear not men in the woods, because they see so few. You will hear the beat of a horse's feet, and the swish of a skirt in the dew, steadily cantering through the misty solitudes, as though they perfectly knew the old lost road through the woods. But there is no road through the woods. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Wealth by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Ivers. Who shall tell what did befall far away in time when once over the lifeless ball? Hung idle stars and suns. What god the element obeyed? Wings of what wind the lichen bore, Wafting the puny seeds of power, Which lodged in rock the rock abrade? And well the primal pioneer Knew the strong task to it assigned, Patient through heaven's enormous year To build in matter 
home for mind. From air the creeping centuries drew, the matted thick, low and wide, this must the leaves of ages strew, the granite slab to clothe and hide, ere wheat can wave its golden pride. What smiths and in what furnace rolled, in dizzy eons dim and mute, the reeling brain can ill compute, copper and iron, lead and gold. What oldest star the fame can save of races perishing to pave the planet with a floor of lime? Dust is their pyramid and mole. Who saw that ferns and palms were pressed under the trembling mountain's breast in the safe herbal of the coal? But when the quarry means were piled, all is waste and worthless till arrives the wise selecting will and out of slime and chaos, wit draws the threads of fair and fit. Then temples rose and towns and marts, the shop of toil, the hall of arts. Then flew the sail across the seas to feed the north from tropic trees. The storm wind wove the torrent span where they were bid the rivers ran. New slaves fulfilled the poet's dream galvanic wire, strong shouldered steam. Then docks were built and crops were stored and ingots added to the hoard. But though light-hearted man forget, remembering matter pays her debt. Still though her motes and masses draw electric thrills and ties of law, which bind the strength of nature wild to the conscience of a child. This recording is in the public domain. Where there is a will, there is a way by Eliza Cook, read for LibriVox.org by Hiranmai. We have faith in old proverbs full surely, for wisdom has traced what they tell, and truth may be drawn up as purely from them as it may from a will. Let us question the thinkers and doers and hear what they honestly say. And you'll find they believe, like bold wooers, in where there is a will, there is a way. The hills have been high for man's mounting, the wood have been dense for his axe, the stars have been thick for his counting, the sands have been wide for his tracks, the sea has been deep for his diving, the poles have been broad for his sway. But bravely he's proved in his striving that where there is a will, there is a way. Have you vices that ask a destroyer or passions that need your control? Let reason become your employer and your body be ruled by your soul. Fight on. Though ye bleed in the trial, resist with all strength that ye may. You may conquer sin's host by denial, for where there is a will, there is a way. Have your poverty's pinching to cope with? Does suffering weigh down your might? Only call up a spirit to hope with, and dawn may come out of the night. Oh, much may be done by defying the ghosts of despair and dismay, and much may be gained by relying on where there is a will, there is a way. Should ye see afar off that worth winning, set out on the journey with trust, and never heed if your path at the beginning should be among brambles and dust. Though it is but by footsteps ye do it, and hardships may hinder and stay, walk with faith, and be sure you'll get through it, for where there is a will, there is a way. End of poem. The recording is in public domain. Wishery by Frank Dempster Sherman Read for LibriVox.org By Laiba Noor Out of the purple drifts From the shadow sea of night On tides of musk a moth uplifts Its weary wings of white Is it a dream or ghost Of a dream that comes to me 
here in the twilight on the coast, blue cinctured by the sea, fashioned of foam and froth, and the dream is ended soon, and lo, whence came the moon white mood comes now the mood white moon end of poem this recording is in the public domain ah what am i but a torrent lyric 29 by sappho read for librivox.org by m lee Ah, what am I but a torrent, headstrong, impetuous, broken, like the spent clamor of waters in the blue canyon. Ah, what art thou but a fern frond, wet with blown spray from the river, diffident, lovely, sequestered, frail on the rock ledge. Yet we are not done for one brief day, while the sun sleeps on the mountain, wild-hearted lover and loved one, safe in Pan's keeping. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.